what I really want to focus on in this talk is observations um, and the role that they play um, in what we're doing and how they're fairly distinct from some of the other things that we're, we're talking about. But one of the main things I wanted to do was I, I learned there are some people here who are not familiar with Mushroom Observer, which is no deep surprise to me, but many of you are. So hopefully those of you who are can bear with going through a, a little bit of an introduction uh, to the, the tool as well. So I wanted to first introduce who I am. Um, so since I was smaller than I can remember, I've been a naturalist. I've been loving to go out into the woods catching snakes and butterflies and all that kind of thing. And when I was about 10, I started getting interested in mushrooms. Um, and that really blossomed into my becoming what I considered to be a citizen mycologist. Um, I ended up going into software development so I spent a good 20 years in my career um, doing software development at large uh, commercial co corporations, doing databases, uh, learning lots of different languages, things like that. So deep, deep technical background um, in addition to this ongoing passion about fungi. Um, I was finally able to bring those together in 2006 uh, when I discovered this wonderful package called Ruby on Rails that gave me a chance to create a uh, tool that I'd always envisioned as a person working on computers where essentially I would take my, my field journal, my photographs, make them available, and also, by the way, open up the doors a little bit and let people to contribute in too. You know, I thought that was a great idea um, and, and it really enabled it. Um, the response has been overwhelming. Honestly, um, the amount of uh, success of the product project has, has just uh, been way beyond my wildest dreams, um, including being invited to an event like this. Um, I actually leveraged it into doing a job that is now much more what I want to be doing. I now am the director for uh, biodiversity informatics for the Encyclopedia of Life. Uh, that happened about two and a half years ago, partially, actually in large part due to Mushroom Observer. Um, and the background and experience I had with that. Um, and since then, um, within the MBL, the Marine Biological Laboratory, I'm now also the center director for the library and informatics group. Um, Mushroom Observer. So this is what it looks like for anyone who's not uh, familiar with it. This was a snapshot uh, taken a few days ago. One of the things you'll notice is it has international reach. These two just happen to be at the top. One's from Mexico, one's from Panama. Um, and uh, sort of the latest and greatest stuff is always shown on the front of the page, and we really do have global reach at this point. Um, so it is a community-based uh, project, uh, global, uh, open source, open content, um, and it's also very open to change. Um, I love getting input from people, love trying to adjust the features so that it fits what people want, um, and things like that, and um, you know, very active uh, community. Um, the current stats on Mushroom Observer, so we uh, um, have about 232,000 images uh, in the system, um, about uh, cl getting close to 100,000 observations. Uh, there's about 3,300 people that have contributed at some level um, into the site. Um, and uh, the surprising thing I discovered last week is that um, uh, about 14% uh, of those, I think 13,000 of the observations actually have been, have, have checked off the mark saying there's a herbarium specimen for it. Um, so I was actually, let's see, uh-oh. That, that was me, I was trying to fix your problem there. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, so the original goal for Mushroom Observer was to record who, what, where, when, images, and notes for fungi. Um, one of the big aspects of that is uh, the licensing choices that I made. Coming from a fairly technical background from the get-go, um, we chose to, or I chose, to uh, support uh, Creative Commons licenses. Um, the default is the attribution share-alike license. Um, and uh, the result of that is that this data gets out there. And the goal of putting those licenses in there is exactly so that the data gets out there. It's more important to me that my data gets shared. I think it's fantastic that there are 76 pages in the Wikimedia family of sites that have this image on it. 
Now, I can't say I'm extremely proud of that image, <laughs> but you know, it, it got picked up, it's got some traction, um, it's around. Um, and one of the wonderful things about this project is I'm not even completely convinced that Zagaric is campestrous because it grows in Southern California and I, I don't know that anybody's actually sequenced those. I mean, you know, what, what really is it? Um, hmm? It's a rumor, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so, uh, a very popular rumor, um, I should note. Um, so, one of the other things that was really important in Mushroom Observer was data sharing. For me, um, and this was one part of what got me involved in the Encyclopedia of Life, trying to take the content that's provided there, separate off the chaff, get the good stuff, share it with the world, and share it in an automated, repeatable way. So. Um, Mushroom Observer right now has, as you can see, 18,000 items uh, in uh, the Encyclopedia of Life. This is the other project I'm working on. Um, and uh, those include text articles about the species, so 600 and some odd, and then you know, a good thousand images that, um, based on the things that people have contributed and the input that we've gotten, I consider those to be good enough quality. And I've certainly done a review of at least 10% of that and never found something I would consider to be a serious error, um, which is pretty impressive for the community, I think. Now, there's a lot of garbage underneath that that's getting ignored, um, but um, I think we are providing a really high quality and we do get uh, labeled as a trusted source from uh, in the EOL world. One of the other features in Mushroom Observer are maps. Um, so this is uh, the distribution of Agaricus campestris according to observations in, or occurrences uh, that are recorded in Mushroom Observer. Again, it's got that big gap in the middle of the country which we all are aware of and need to find a way to address. Um, there are also species treatments uh, in the site. Uh, so there have been some student projects, particularly Tom Volk has, and, and Pringle have been helpful in uh, encouraging those and getting those to grow. It's an area I would like to get more uh, input into. Um, this is a description of uh, Tremides versicolor. Um, one of the directions I wanna move this to, so again, as mentioned, this is a very text-based, human-readable type of description. Um, we need to go to computable descriptions, and it's something that I actually have a student working on, um, trying to figure out how to do that in a more sort of crowdsourcey kind of way that's compatible with Mushroom Observer, um, and would very much love to talk to people more. I particularly want to talk to Pick about that, because I know he's been down that path. Um, and one of the things that this obviously enables is automated identifications. But one of the things I've realized that from an observational standpoint that this enables is getting people to really write down what they saw. A lot of people are happy saying, I saw Tremides versicolor, and they type that in. They don't say anything about what it was growing on, you know, other details about the organism that, you know, smell, taste, things like that, that may actually be important features in the long run. Yes, this might be a perfectly reasonable name at the moment to put on it, although I'm not sure whether that paper blowing apart Tremides versicolor has come out yet or not, but I expect this is gonna shatter to the winds and there's gonna be you know, 20 different species or something in this group. And trying to reconstruct that just from a bunch of observations that say Tremides versicolor is very, very hard, um, if not impossible. So we gotta get better about capturing the data and having a system that automatically describes fungi gives a pathway to do that. And I've got some very specific ideas. I've got a talk I'm doing on Tuesday that goes into more detail about that. Um, but this is really a, a big, important thing for us to look at. Mushroom Observer um, also has a whole bunch of stuff about identifications. Now, my master's thesis was on compute, was on um, uh, getting computers to do biological identification of biological species. So I totally believed in the automated machine-assisted identification path. It seemed like the wave of the future to me. I realized how hard it was for Mushroom Observer. I just said, yeah, let's just let people make suggestions and vote. This works really, really well. I mean, the automated stuff is great for specialists, for really understanding the differentiation between that stuff. But for a lot of things, getting the crowd to come in, make suggestions, participate, 
is, is, should not be underestimated in terms of a powerful way of getting effective, meaningful um, identifications. Um, the other thing that's fun, uh, you may have noticed this is uh, uh, slid off the side there, but this was identified as a Calvatia indigo. Anyone who knows Calvatia knows there isn't a Calvatia indigo. And anyone who looks carefully at that will realize that's a deflated basketball. <laughs> it also has a comment from someone in our audience um, saying how they love the 1st of April. Um, so. One of the things I love about the, the community that's been created in Mushroom Observer is they've got a sense of humor. They are willing to just throw stuff up there because we think it's funny. And that's okay. And that's actually, I would actually argue it's more than okay, it's actually essential for a crowdsourced system to work and that we gotta keep our sense of humor in this stuff. Um, one of the things I, uh, David Rohr is here, and one of the things that I think is very delightful and one of the things that inspired me to get deeper into this is that Mushrooms Demystified has a sense of humor. There's a lot of good stuff in there, um, and a lot of the books that get generated are, are dry, and if we, if we can keep that sense of humor, keep that, but at the same time being precise and scientific, um, that's, that's the balance I think we need to strike. So this gets into one of the most key features, I think, in the success of Mushroom Observer and I think is gonna be necessary to be successful uh, for a project like this, which is to taking, taking care of your people. Um, I have adapted a quote here from the open source community. Um, it says, uh, if you treat them as your most important assets, uh, they will return the favor by becoming your most important assets. Um, so if you really, nurture the community, find people who help you nurture the community, it, it really makes it, makes it happen. Um, it's also really important to enjoy the struggle, which is people learning, people figuring out how to do this. I think um, uh, Rod Tullis has done a wonderful job of that in Mushroom Observer, of really trying to encourage people along, asking questions that he may know, have an answer and opinion about, but just asking it as a question encourages people to engage um, and, uh, and go further. There are downsides to all this, this people stuff. Um, people generally are lazy, so you need to make stuff easy for them. Um, if you give them simple ways to do things, they'll go ahead and do it even if it's not right. Um, and trying to encourage the right behavior is, is a, a skill in and of itself. In my experience, I've gone both ways on this. I currently believe that avoiding anonymity and privacy issues as much as possible is a good thing. Make stuff apparent, make it clear who's doing what. Um, get people to put their name on it. Um, and uh, you will get conflicts in communities. There have been some real challenges, um, some of which have not risen to the surface of visibility in Mushroom Observer, some of which have. Um, and you need to be, have a process for dealing with that and you need to have people who are committed to, to, to resolving those peacefully. Um, there's a really interesting question that I'm just struggling with. There's a dialogue I've been having with uh, Elsa and Tom and some other folks about what do we mean by expertise? This is a question I've certainly talked about with Rod and other heavy participants in the site. Um, and it's really something we need to deal with. Um, in a larger context when we're trying to bring in quote citizen scientists and quote professional scientists, we all know it's a continuum. We all know we bring different skills. And, how do you, and one of our goals is to get those people trained up. And how do, at what point do we give them what authority and uh, how do we deal with those things? And there are some things that are probably gonna shift in Mushroom Observer around that, but I wanna have that conversation. and would love to have more discussions with this. Also dealing with garbage. Really important, you, you're gonna get garbage. There's bad data, there's gonna get, you're gonna get stuff in there and you need to have good effective ways of filtering it. It's also really important that the site keeps fresh. A lot of sites, um, they come into existence, they may have data that's coming into them that you can't see. They may have changes that are going on that's just simply not visible. I think one of the lucky things I happened to do was make the homepage the activity log where the latest and greatest stuff shows up there. So someone goes there, they see the latest images that have come in. You see that, that people are participating. I go there and get overwhelmed that every day there are literally hundreds and hundreds of observations coming into the site, more than I can possibly keep up with, um, which is great. 
and you want that. That's what, what you want to keep it vital, keep it fresh. Um, you need to be careful to design for change. So there's some real advantages to having a book that you actually stick on a shelf and is, is done at some point. Um, there are certain things you don't have to deal with in terms of name changes. Um, yes, I want to update that name, but what does that really mean to all of these hundreds of observations that have gone on in the past that have been labeled with this old name? How do those change? How do those evolve? Um, that whole process becomes much more dynamic and much harder. Um, one of the other things, uh, just what I want to mention, were a few new features uh, that we're working on in Mushroom Observer. Um, computable descriptions, as I mentioned. There's also a mobile app that um, Eric uh, and his team have been working on that is going to connect to Mushroom Observer and provide observations. We're going to be doing an alpha test of that tomorrow during the foray. If you have an Android phone, um, let us know. Please come meet with Eric and I. Um, and we'll get you going on that, and you can check it out and give us some good feedback on it. It's not yet hooked up to Mushroom Observer, but it will be soon, and um, it's, it's a great thing to see developing and would love to encourage and get further with. So I wanted to end with some philosophy. Um, a lot of you folks are familiar with these problems. This audience is probably more sophisticated than any other audience than I, I, I know. I actually think this is particularly relevant in the fungal world. So one, this, what is a species problem? Um, and uh, you know, there's this general idea of a group of organisms capable of interbreeding and to produce fertile offspring. Lots of problems with that. There's even one in this picture, that yellow thing up there that people probably know is pretty, as far as I understand, pretty much a clonal uh, population. And so is that, is, what, what's that in terms of a species? I, I have no idea. Um, but one of the really important things to realize is from a computer perspective, from modeling it as a technical person, I ultimately have to come back to the fact that a species is truly defined by a type specimen sitting somewhere on some shelf or photograph or whatever type, et cetera, um, a name and a circumscription that is believed to describe the species that specimen belongs to. It's very loosey-goosey. From a, from a technical standpoint. And getting it, that's going to change over time. And we know that. We've experienced that as taxonomists. But it makes for some real significant problems with this long-term management of things. And um, while we may be, I, I, there's certainly some debate I have with the statement without a, a sequence specimen, it's a rumor, but it's a great, uh, great, great you know, thing to push buttons. Um, but even with one, it is still only a hypothesis. So any identification is based on a set of, you know, scientific guesses that will change over time. It's remarkably stable for what it is when you really look at it, but it's, it is un unstable. As opposed to an observation. Observations are really about the facts, and I would like us to think of the observational data as being the facts, the identification being a connection that is made to those facts. And the more we record those facts, the better off we will be in the long run in managing all of this. So it's the metadata, who, when, and where. You'll notice I took what out of that list. I put it down in observed features. Because you actually don't observe that species when you go out there. You observe a bunch of things. You have an observational experience. And then you go, oh, I think that probably connects with this name, right? It's a separate process, and we need to think of it that way. Um, sequence data is also very important observational data. But again, there's a loose connection between sequence data and species. If you talk to the folks that are doing the barcode of life, they have these things called bins, which are not species. They are clusters of, of sequences that end up in the same general location. Um, they might be species. They might be groups of species. And we all know it's all kind of loosey-goosey anyway. Um, and so um, it's really important that we, we look at that and model that correctly in the, the tools that we create. So to sort of summarize all of that, the way I look at it is that we have people and specimens sort of coming into this system. 
I'm not quite sure why I put double arrows there. Uh, this was something I did early this morning. I've been trying to think of this, and we'll, 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 we'll refine this. I also kind of think of these arrows as lenses. Um, these go into creating observations. This is really what the facts are, the information like that. We then connect it to these hypothesized uh, genotype, phenotype clusters. Actually, those aren't really hypothesized. Um, but we have these descriptions of, of phenotypes. We have these uh, genotypes that we're aware of. And then finally, it gets out to species. But it is fairly indirect. And we need to acknowledge that. And it's part of the magic of what we're doing. So finally, I wanted to end with a, a acknowledgments. Um, top there, Nancy Wilson, my mother, who inspired me to go out and collect chanterelles in her backyard and actually let me eat them. Um, Margaret McKinney, who she actually learned at the, the knee of. Uh, David Aurora, who I would not be standing here if it were not for his book. I have no question of that. Uh, Fungus Federation of Santa Cruz, who definitely refined my knowledge and really feels like it brought it up. The Mushroom Observer community in general, those of you who are participating, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's really wonderful. Jason Hollinger, I have to acknowledge as, uh, as an incredibly powerful force in the Mushroom Observer community. He keeps it going when I can't. Um, and we have great dialogue and uh, just really an amazing fellow. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Marine Biological Laboratory and the EOL, so I get to do this as my day job. Yay! <laughs> Um, and many, many more. There are many people in this audience that I also want to thank for all their contributions. I just couldn't fit you all on the slide. So thank you all.